uh, we also have a website, uh, tuxedo.org, where we have more information about webinars and other resources that we uh, help curate. And both are just really good places to ask questions, find out more. Often it seems that with the ETDs, you're kind of isolated, um, even at your own organization. And just to connect with other people who understand and who perhaps have seen similar problems or think about um, similar situations that you have that maybe you don't have at your um, institution itself. The current board members for Tuxedo are Billy Peterson Lugo, Colleen Lyon, Shelly Barber, that's me, um, Umi O'Hara, and Leanna Martin. And our uh, mission that has started in 2009 and we continue to this day is to provide a network of support for ETD professionals in the state of Texas and to connect them with organizations and resources that enrich the work they do. As I said, trying to find those like um, people who can understand it better. And with that, I'm going to hand off to our presenters today um, who will introduce themselves and um, have a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, and hello, everybody. I'm so glad that you've joined us um, for this April webinar about accessibility. Laura, Liz, and I are going to be sharing information about the status of accessibility in institutional repositories um, based on a 2019 survey. We're going to talk about gaps in accessibility for ETDs and share templates and workflow ideas, ideas <laughs> for improving ETD accessibility. We hope this webinar will introduce you to some of the main issues with accessibility and give you some ideas of how you can improve accessibility at your own institution. So here's a little bit of information about our presenters today. Uh, Liz Johnson is the formatting and degree software specialist at Montana State. Um, I'm Colleen Lyon. I'm the head of scholarly communications at the University of Texas at Austin. And Laura Waugh is the digital collections librarian at Texas State University. I just want to note that none of us are accessibility experts, um, and we have instead tried to become more knowledgeable about accessibility just based on the positions that we have at our respective institutions. Um, we figured we probably aren't the only ones in this situation, and that's a big reason why we wanted to share some of what we've learned. So first, we want to talk about an accessibility survey that Laura and I were involved in. The group listed here um, started working together in either late 2018 or early 2019. Kind of hard to tell from email when that started. Um, but all of us were interested in knowing more about the level of accessibility for items in our institutional repositories, which I might abbreviate IR. So that's what I mean when I say that. Um, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with the term, institutional repositories are uh, kind of like online archives um, that are designed to showcase the research output of an institution. So if your school has an ETD program, it's likely that your ETDs um, are going to an IR or maybe to ProQuest or possibly to both. Um, IRs include much more than just ETDs, um, but as you'll see later, ETDs are a big chunk of what is shared in most institutional repositories. So a little bit about the survey. Um, we had two main goals with this survey, understanding the current landscape and then identifying the average level of content accessibility. We were specifically interested in the accessibility of the items within repositories um, and not necessarily the accessibility of the repository software itself um, because that issue had been addressed um, in some other articles that we had found. The survey um, that we created was shared in the fall of 2019, um, and the report was released last summer. You'll find more information about the report um, and the data at the links below, and I'll make sure to share um, those links as soon as I'm done presenting. So here we go, results. Um, we had a total of 145 responses um, that were collected from 20 different countries, um, with the majority of those responses coming from the United States, 74%. Um, among those in the US, 24 individual states were represented, with a majority from Texas at 19%, followed by New York, California, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, and then 49% were other states. 
Also, it's not shown here, um, but the majority of our respondents were from doctoral granting universities. Um, it was about 80 respondents that um, uh, are were from doctoral granting universities. And almost 60 of our responses came from institutions with student populations between 10,000 and 30,000. So we asked people to identify the types of collections that they had in their IRs. Um, the numbers on the Y axis are the number of responses for that particular category. Um, and as you can see from the chart, the vast majority of IRs include scholarly materials and electronic theses and dissertations, ETDs. Um, but then you'll notice that there's also university archival materials, special collections, journals, AB materials, data sets, and then our favorite other category. We also asked people to tell us how large their institutional repositories were based on the number of items that were in those repositories. Most respondents reported having over 10,000 items in their repository. The next highest category was between 1,000 um, and 5,000. And then um, in the number three spot was uh, repositories with between 5,001 and 10,000 items in their repository. As we'll mention in, in a moment, um, this is going to play a role in some of the challenges to providing improved accessibility to IR content. The size factor is going to um, be part of that challenge. One thing that our group didn't examine, <coughs> but that we acknowledge would be interesting to look at, um, is to break out the data into um, accessibility practices based on like the size of the repository, the size of the institution, perhaps country of origin. Um, but those are uh, data that we weren't able to dig into. Um, we have shared the data though, so we would encourage anybody else to do that. Okay, so um, when we asked people about their current accessibility practices, the most popular response we received was that there are no current accessibility practices for IR content. It was about 27% of the results. Although many of those people noted that they are interested in moving forward with improving accessibility. Of those that did indicate some accessibility practices in their institutional repositories, most are performing a combination of PDF editing, um, adding alternative text, or a pre-accession software for text-based items. Of those institutions doing um, like captioning and transcription work, uh, most of them are using automated options like YouTube captions, um, or perhaps using a vendor, or so sometimes they're just requiring the depositor to provide captions before it can be uploaded to a repository. Um, this also comes into play when we're looking at data um, on levels of accessibility to IR content. So we know that most ETDs use the PDF format. Um, so we wanted to share some information about what people are doing to make those more accessible. Um, our respondents told us that um, editing the PDFs for accessibility in their repositories primarily includes adding tags, adjusting the title recognition, and then converting um, the PDF to a PDF A copy. Most of the respondents who are doing text accessibility checks are using either Adobe software or Microsoft Word to do that. When we look at accessibility of the IR content overall, um, most respondents are more confident in the accessibility of text and image documents, and they're less confident for the audio and video files in their IRs. The vast majority of our respondents um, did not restrict access to materials if they didn't meet accessibility standards. Um, and then when we asked them uh, to assess the overall state of accessibility in their of content in their repository, most respondents feel that their repositories are either moderately accessible or not very accessible. So there's definitely room for improvement there. We also wanted to know if respondents had partnerships with campus disability services or a, a similarly um, uh, phrased or, or um, um, a similar office on their campus. Uh, overwhelmingly, respondents indicated that there was little to no formal partnerships with these kinds of offices. Um, since this is an ETD crowd, I want to mention that we did not specifically ask about partnerships. 
um, between libraries and uh, campus graduate school offices. So that could be something else that would be interesting to look at. When we asked about the existence of accessibility policies, most respondents indicated that there is a library and or a university um, wide policy on accessibility, but there was nothing specific to repository content. Um, most others that um, you know, indicated some other kind of policy said that there was contact information for individual item requests rather than maybe a specific repository um, policy about accessibility. So um, before I talk a little bit about this, I just want to note, we conducted this survey in the fall of 2019, which was prior to the pandemic. So um, it's possible that the numbers represented here may have increased um, during the pandemic as you know, students, faculty, and the public have less access to physical resources. Um, but at the time of our survey, when we asked about the average number of requests um, that repository managers were getting um, for making uh, content accessible, um, most had not received any uh, request in the past year or more. That was by far our most um, popular response. Only one respondent indicated receiving a large number of requests, over 500 per year, which is a huge. Um, and a few others, um, six, indicated that they received upwards of 50 requests per year. So this is my favorite colorful slide here. Um, we asked the people taking the survey to rank various potential challenges to the accessibility of content in their IRs. Um, unsurprisingly, this varied widely um, with a lot of different things to consider for you know, various different repository uh, managers. By and large, um, limited staffing was ranked as the top challenge, no surprise there, followed by finances. Um, I'm assuming uh, lack of finances rather than too much, <laughs> uh, lack of expertise um, and difficulty in addressing the existing content. And this is really reasonable when you um, think back to most of our respondents reported upwards of 10,000 items in their repositories, which could be really difficult to kind of do a retrospective look at and try to improve the accessibility of that many different items. Okay, so um, when we ask people what factors contributed to their current accessibility practices, the top response that we got was a personal commitment to accessibility. So people are recognizing that this is an important issue and it's something that they want to try to improve and do something about even um, without uh, either a library or an institutional mandate to do so. Um, other top responses included um, institution or library pressure related to legal compliance, um, requests from users for accessible content, um, and you could imagine those institutions that are getting, you know, 50 to 500 responses, that would be a big um, push to try to improve accessibility. Um, and then finally, um, some people reported that their library just has an emphasis on accessibility, and so that was a reason why that they were implementing some of the practices um, that they'd implemented. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Laura, who can share a little bit more about the discussion and key findings. Yes, thank you, Colleen. Uh, well, first, um, we wanted to mention part of this study also included getting some qualitative data and getting actual feedback because obviously no survey is perfect um, to capture everything. And we thought this would be a good way to really get uh, personal feedback from folks. And this was one of the comments that um, that we really appreciated um, that resonated with us. And it mentions this, one of the biggest driving forces for accessibility is that personal commitment um, and that IR managers want to do more and improve, but it's often up to one person who's managing these collections on top of other job duties and such. And, and also that in the survey, most respondents don't have formal partnerships or sometimes any relationship with some of those other campus offices. And it's really up to the individual to educate themselves, educate others, and do all of this with competing priorities. And next, um, 
we also, um, another kind of interesting comment that was identified was this idea of establishing consistent standards. So one of the findings in the survey was that most often there's a general institutional or library policy on accessibility, um, but very rarely one that is specifically addresses institutional repositories. So it's most common to just include contact information for those requests, but by and large, respondents indicated that they rarely receive requests, um, and library staff are often the ones that are responsible for driving those efforts on policies and standards. And it can be difficult to create those standards and formulate that when there's not a lot of consistency, even within your institution or with other institutions. Um, that was another really interesting comment. Also, um, several of the comments address this challenge of the self-deposit model in accessibility, and we found that very interesting. So a lot of folks for this audience might use Vireo um, or another ETD workflow process for deposits. In general, IRs often receive these submissions to the IR uh, from faculty or graduate students self-submitting um, and or through Vireo to the IR. But um, back to that responsibility aspect of this too is looking at who's responsible for ensuring accessibility to that content. Is it the student and faculty when they submit it or the um, IR manager who's limited on staffing obviously, but um, the great thing too in some of these comments we noticed was this uh, lack of this level of trust that submissions will not be edited after the fact. And that would put the responsibility more on the submitter to ensure accessibility. And again, there's that comes back to the fact that there's often not a standard or policy in place around that that we can point to. And then with limited staffing and trying to check every submission. So that was a really great comment as well. And some of these limits and challenges. Um, these were some of the biggest challenges we found in the study that really seemed like things we could start addressing first. Um, but making greater progress for accessibility of IR content and ETDs, one of the biggest barriers at this point um, that we found is that IRs have been focusing a lot on the collecting content for several years and really promoting that on their campuses to build up those repositories. And again, as Colleen mentioned in the study, we found many institutions now have 5,000 to 10,000 items in their repository. So going back to resolve some of these issues with accessibility for all of those is going to be um, a, big, a big hurdle. Um, and also those lack of uh, resources standardized standardized policies, um, definitely the limited staffing with so many different juggling different job duties, and then kind of working on how determining how to develop and implement these policies and workflows and models that would make sense for institutions. So some of the things also the areas we found that we could improve. Um, Based on the survey uh, and some of our conversations around this, um, one was the lack of policies and standards being a challenge. And we'd like to look at ways that folks could share any existing policies or documentation that they have. Um, maybe these are requested via listservs at various times, or people might in pockets be asking colleagues, but it would be great to centralize this. Um, maybe creating templates, um, examples that institutions could then customize and bringing in the broader, you know, IR and ETD community to come together and, and work on this as a community. And then also, as we mentioned, ETDs were identified as a major content type for IRs. 
So there are ongoing efforts looking at embargoes and various policies and style guides. Um, looking ahead, sharing out those uh, style guides and uh, specific things for ETDs, centralizing that into communities. And among the collaborators in this study, one of the guiding goals was to establish kind of a baseline measurement looking at the current practices, of course, pre-pandemic now, but 2019, 18. But um, one thing we discussed was creating a like a maturity matrix so that institutions could better understand where they're at as far as their levels of accessibility for ETDs and IRs. And that might help um, as far as building this community to see what areas you can start scaling up and ways to improve. Um, of course, just within the limitations and challenges we have, but working together to build more of that and have some clear goals that we can have in mind and measurable actions we could take to achieve it. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Liz. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just waiting for our screen share ability. Okay. So hello, my name is uh, Liz Johnson and I'm the formatting advisor with the Graduate School here at Montana State University, where we have about 2000 graduate students at any time to give you a sense of our scale. Um, so I work in the graduate school where all of the formatting comes through us and I deal with um, our final submissions before I hand our ETDs over to the MSU library to post on their um, our M MSU scholar works repository. Um, so I'm the only formatting advisor here at MSU and my position is also split between coding and communications. So I wanted to improve the ETD accessibility without actually increasing my workload a whole bunch, since I only focus on the formatting part-time. Um, so I, what I'm gonna show you is what I did here at MSU to improve our resources for students um, and what our own workflow is like. Um, I'm hoping it gives you some practical tips on what you can do in your own university to foster a more inclusive mindset and create resources that are more geared towards accessibility. Um, so the document accessibility I was looking to improve was making it easier for documents to be readable by screen readers and other assistive technologies. And I was asked by the MSU library um, to look into this and to see how we could include accessibility as part of the formatting um, for our ETDs. We did take a look at some software that aimed at making uh, accessibility and general formatting easier and more automated for students, but we felt that they weren't intuitive enough quite yet. Um, so instead, we just decided to make our own resources better. Um, I'll mostly be talking about Word today, but I will get into LaTeX a little bit later too. So let me pull up our website here. We have a, um, this is our ETD website for Montana State University. It's just montana.edu slash ETD. Um, we have a page dedicated to the formatting. And then from here, we have a web page on accessibility um, which I'll get a little bit more into later. So for our students, we require all of the ETDs to follow a specific formatting guideline, how the for front matter is structured, how the back matter is structured, the headings in the body are structured with a first, second, and third level style. Um, although we do allow for some flexibility for manuscript chapters, um, and we let students use whatever citation style is best for their discipline. We offer students a visual example of what these guidelines are um, in these sample pages that I have up on the screen right now. So I'll start reviewing our accessibility tasks um, through one of our templates here linked on our formatting page. Let me pull them up here. So the first thing you always see when coming across document accessibility is the use of headings. In Word, this is achieved by use of styles. So if you're in the Home tab, there should be a section or a dropdown called Styles. You can see in this Word template that we provide students, I've pre-formatted all of the styles to match what the heading requirements are. 
um, and I've applied it to most of these example headings. So when students download our template and they copy the work into the template, they can apply the styles to their various headings, um, and this also sets the formatting for them. So for example, this first level heading here, which has been unformatted, they go to the Home tab, Style, and choose First Level Heading. You can see it does the spacing for them, it does the underlining for them, um, and this is what I try to use as a big selling point for students. Let the system do the, the work for you. Um, we'll do another example here with their second level heading. I just highlight it, find the appropriate style, and apply it. So these styles that have been applied, um, I'm going to move this down a little, create a helpful navigation which, with se sections and subsections, which you can view under View, Show, Navigation Pane. And it pulls up all of those heading styles that I've applied. Um, and you can see here, these are subsections. Um, and this navigation will be retained as bookmarks um, when it's properly exported as a PDF. So here you can see um, that where these um, styles uh, are applied to in your PDF. So this helps give a paper structure so that screen reader technology can easily organize the paper into its various chapters and chunks. Um, they know what the headings are, um, what um, to expect throughout the document, so it doesn't look like a 300-page document with no organization, because that would be very difficult for someone using a screen reader to, to read. So I'll show you a document um, before I set all of the style headings. The default style headings in Word usually have these skinny blue fonts, um, which probably doesn't match anybody's um, style headings in for their ETDs. So what I did, I took an old template um, that was outdated. I manually set the formatting for my headings. Um, then I can reset these styles by having my heading highlighted, right-clicking a heading and clicking Update Heading to Match Selection. I can also right-click and rename it. So if this was my chapter title, um, and I just do that for all of my headings here. Uh, so the, um, you do have to go in descending order because Word knows that heading two is a subsection of heading one and so on, um, which is why my chart here um, explains. You can also create your own style too. There's usually a drop down that says create a style. You can hit modify and set the, the you know, if it's a heading four or if it's a title or a subtitle or a quote. Um, you can rename it and set the formatting from here. In my template, I set for students the um, for captioning and for block quotes. Um, so they just have to highlight the text and apply it, and it does all the formatting. Um, the one annoying problem that I did find with this system, that if a heading needs to be in line with a paragraph, like for our third level headings here, um, you can't just hit backspace because it will apply that formatting for the whole paragraph. Um, you need to figure out how to do a style separator. Uh, on PC, this is easily done by just hitting um, Control Alt Enter. So I'd have to fix that, but <laughs> you, you can at least see um, there might be some hidden thing that you didn't expect when you try to update a template or do accessibility like this that you might have to Google. But even with that hiccup, we found that it was a, a major improvement over our old ETD templates. Um, let's see. Uh, I did bring our updated template um, to our Academic Technology and Outreach Office, who have an accessibility specialist, um, and they liked my updates and gave me some additional tips. Um, to address the question in the chat, um, I wrote some info in um, our own FAQ on how to set the styles. Um, so under ETD FAQ, formatting FAQ, um, there's a question asking how to use styles and word to format your headings. So if you kind of want that overview again, but with some more explanation, um, there's a page called how to use styles for headings, and it kind of explains what I just explained um, here. Um, 
it's basically just updating the the style so you can also you know go on microsoft word um, to see if they have some information for you as well so on our accessibility page you can see what other tasks we ask of students if students export their document uh, word document properly um, the styles they have applied will be retained as bookmarks so we open up here um, and go to file save as and go to more options um, we can change it to a pdf um, and at least on a pc you can click the options button and there will be this you know include non-printing information create bookmarks using headings um, you hit OK, and then that will create these bookmarks when you save it. Um, so it's good to, you know, it's good to do it as a Word doc, but you need it to be retained as a PDF. Um, and all of these that I'm explaining here are explained on my accessibility page too. Um, oh, the, the question is how to create a template. It's just a Word document that I saved um, and then uploaded. Uh, so literally the student just downloads like a Word document that I've created. So it's not like a special um, like kind of document or anything. Um, other accessibility tasks we ask of students um, that are easy but important um, is adding alt text to images. Um, this is usually pretty easy in Word. Often you'll just have to right click an image find edit alt text and then write a one to two sentence description explaining what this image is so that um, the when screen readers come across it it knows what to explain to the reader uh, let's see here um, one other thing that we ask students to do is update their document properties so we use Adobe Acrobat, um, our university provides it. To do this, you can go to File, Properties. I always make sure that the title is set, the author is set, and then under Initial View that it shows the document title up at the top instead of the file name. Uh, and I make sure that the language is set. And this gives the file itself more metadata and information for the user. Um, you, there's also a great accessibility checker in Word where you can, you know, play around with this and see what, what it tells you to do um, or to look for. Um, so I highly recommend playing around with that as well. Um, so the next step in this process is actually getting the students to use what resources you put out there. Because as we all know, uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Um, so I've looked for ways to integrate accessibility into the formatting as much as possible. And I try to include it while using an inclusion mindset rather than a compliance mindset, because I do want these resources to be more inclusive and to introduce students to this concept. Um, not only do I have this accessibility page, but I try to include it in all of my formatting resources, um, including the sample pages we talked about earlier and any tutorials that I give out. Um, and I try to update this information as I learn and grow too, because as we said before, I'm not an expert. I'm just trying to, you know, slowly make these resources and um, things better uh, for accessibility. I also send a semester email to graduating students, and I hold three ETD seminars a semester with the library and the writing center. So I try to include accessibility as part of the formatting uh, in those as well. We also have a checklist before that students have to fill out before they submit their paper um, and accessibility is listed as one of the requirements although this is more of a an honor system kind of thing uh, what i would really like to see in the future is to introduce students to this concept earlier in their college career um, rather than just the last semester uh, when they're doing the most stressful thing they've probably done up in their life um, academically and I would want to do this maybe through some dedicated workshops open to all graduate students and maybe even faculty um, that gives an overview of some of these practical steps that we just talked about um, that they can do to start improving the accessibility on all of their documents. 
So I try to acknowledge that people have different learning styles as well um, and try to provide both written and audio visual uh, tutorials on how to achieve certain formatting and accessibility tasks. Um, as we saw before, I have this formatting FAQ that walks them through a lot of the tasks that most people get wrong and that I see a lot. Um, I also produce video tutorials, um, and I think these are probably my best assets for students. Um, I produced one that's about 18 minutes long that really holds their hand through this process. Um, goes through the detail from start to finish. I also have a six minute introduction to the templates and accessibility tasks um, that I think is really good. This is good for students who are more experienced in Word, um, but even the most experienced students might not know how to use styles or what alt text is. So I recommend that to all my students um, just to give it a watch through. And just so you know, I use Screencast-O-Matic uh, to record these videos. Um, and this is a free screen capture tool that I like a lot because it has a truncate feature, meaning you can pause a bunch and then just re-record over the section that you just recorded uh, because I get really shy and nervous during these and I stutter a lot during my recordings. And students are busy, so I try to write out a script before I record it and I try to be as succinct as possible. Um, I also try to ensure that the videos at least have closed captioning, which YouTube usually does for me, but um, if I have it, I will also add a transcript too, which if you make a script, you probably have a pretty close transcript already. So most of our students use Word, um, and our university provides a copy of Word to students, but our math and engineering students uh, often use LaTeX instead. And um, LaTeX, accessibility in LaTeX is a little bit tricky. Um, the PDFs themselves are not currently accessible due to the equations and other factors, but LaTeX can still have its advantages. Visually impaired people can actually use the source file if they know how to use LaTeX, uh, or they can convert it into an accessible format. So the links here on this page are interesting to read, even if your students don't use LaTeX. Um, it talks a lot about equations and accessibility with those. Um, the bookmarks and navigation in LaTeX PDFs are usually pretty good, and I'll ask students to add some alt text in with their documents, but your repository might even consider adding the source LaTeX file as a supplementary document. Um, that's one way to improve the accessibility of those documents. Um, let me go back here. So accessibility is also good for those who aren't using this kind of assistive technology. Um, for example, everyone can benefit with the use of those navigation tools and navigation panes that we found earlier. Um, if you have a document that's 300 pages, and even if you know, you're not visually impaired and using a screen reader, it's helpful to kind of scroll through it and know what to expect or just jump right to it instead of scrolling for 240 pages. Um, one obvious example of accessibility and how it helps everybody is if you had blue text on a red background, it would be impossible for some colorblind people to read, but it would also be hard for everybody else too, um, which makes me think of some of the color choices of some of the early 2000s websites um, and how they were maybe not the best choices. Um, another example is the handicap buttons that open doors, obviously immensely helpful for anybody who's in a wheelchair. Um, but you might have found it helpful if you're carrying an armful of groceries or a big box into a building. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention um, during my portion is that I feel it's often overlooked um, is making your websites accessible, the ones that students and faculty visit. It's a little silly to ask students to do these kinds of tasks for their ETDs um, and produce accessible media and papers uh, if you're not doing the same to, to improve things uh, on your own website. So during my research, um, it was really weird to see websites that would talk about the importance of document accessibility, but then have like non-accessible hyperlinks or very obvious color issues. Um, some basic steps here are to just be sure you don't have any hyperlinks that just say click here or more info, uh, which is a sin I see a lot in emails um, when you have hyperlinks there. Um, because it's not very descriptive text, and if a screen reader pulls out that text, it'll just say, this is a link that says, click here. Um, 
Also make sure you use the proper use of headings, just like in the Word docs that we just kind of explained. Um, and try to link only accessible documents yourself um, and check for colorblind accessibility. There's websites you can um, plug in some colors to see, you know, what the levels of colorblind accessibility are. So uh, I hope my portion has exposed you to a few practical tips that you can use with students um, and maybe take away some of this intimidation of accessibility. Um, Word has some fantastic one to two minute tutorials that I highly recommend that'll just go over one task very succinctly. Um, so I recommend checking those out as well. At least for me, once I got over this intimidation hump or the why should I really care hump, uh, it, it opened up like a new world of resources and perspectives to me. Um, and it wasn't actually so conceptual. So I hope my portion has at least got you a little bit farther down that path. Um, over to our question slide. Thank you, Liz. Um, this is Colleen, and I, I already saw all of that, but it was still so fun to see you kind of demoing everything. Um, we do have a couple questions. One I think you may have already um, addressed, and it looks like there is um, an answer, um, or a, a partial answer at least, but um, in, asking about um, information for creating templates, like are there any like guides um, that you have um, found helpful? And um, we do have a note in here about lynda.com should have some um, uh, links. And you also mentioned some, you know, short Microsoft videos. But if you have any other suggestions, you know, let us know. Yeah, we I kind of inherited a template from the last person. And it really was just a Word doc that was pre-formatted with the hopes of students, you know, clicking over or something, deleting it and typing in their own thing. Um, but uh, lynda.com, which I believe is LinkedIn learning now, um, they were really helpful for kind of learning these few steps. Um, so I would recommend checking them out too. Thank you. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to tell everybody, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A box and we'll, we'll try to answer um, them for you. There's another question that I think is maybe for just like the attendees in general, but has anyone had an institution um, stop using all caps in their formatting standards. Mixed case is physically easier to read. So if anybody is at an institution that has stopped using all caps in their formats, um, people are curious. <laughs> oh, it looks like Mississippi State quit using all caps years ago. So that's great. And Laura and Liz, if you're seeing questions that I'm missing, feel free to just shout them out. And Texas A&M. That's interesting about the all caps. Good question. I have a question for Liz, too, real quick. Um, just following up, do you find that most of the students do use the templates and follow, like, have you noticed in general more? I think there's been an increase since I improved my, both my templates and my resources around them, like my tutorial videos. Um, not all students use them. I pretty much, I, I push them to use it as much as possible, but sometimes they are stubborn or they already have it in a Word doc <laughs> and try to retroactively do it. Um, but I would say maybe, 75% of the students try to use the template um, that aren't using LaTeX. Liz, and I see a question here um, that you partially answered, but another part of the question is, are you remediating documents after students have submitted them to you? I don't like to touch the documents after students submit them. Like, they, it has to come from them. Um, so I encourage this accessibility as much as possible, and I try to lead them in that direction, and I mention it to them when I work on them with formatting. But if they just don't do it, I don't have the resources to, to force them to do it, um, and I also don't touch their documents afterwards. Um, so our accessibility isn't perfect yet. Um, uh, I will. The only thing I will do is I'll update those document properties if they haven't done that, um, and that's just you know the file name or the document title. Um, 
that I feel comfortable doing, but I won't touch any of the content uh, inside the paper. Liz, we've got another one. Um, do you find academic departments supporting your templates and efforts? I don't interact too much with the, the departments. Um, and I'm not sure if they know about most of my accessibility efforts. I usually just work directly with students. Um, the most that I hear from students is that, oh, my advisor said I should get in touch with you. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of all I really hear from them. I would like it if this kind of accessibility information was a little bit more widespread on campus, uh, which is kind of why I mentioned wanting to do like workshops with all of our grad students and faculty, because it it seems right now that they, they're just getting to this information, you know, like a few months before they turn it in, um, just right at the end. So I kind of want to push that and make it more open and available across campus. I will second that for so many things, <laughs> like catching students right at the end when they're graduating. It's like, oh, it's too late. Yeah. Um, there's another question here. Is your institutional repository open access to the public? I'm pretty sure yours is, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, our ScholarWorks repository is open access. Okay, here's another one. Have you thought of trying to get accessibility info into new undergraduate orientation? That's an interesting question. Um, I guess I haven't really thought much about the undergraduate side of things just because I work at the graduate school and with graduate students. Um, and I guess they're my first hurdle to, to introduce this to. But I, I think it should be, you know, um, I don't know. I, I would love it if it were talked about more with undergraduates too and just generally introduced as part of, you know, document creation um, with papers and with students. But that's kind of a a bigger fish. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question here. What has your experience been with the grad school or the rest of the grad school, if you're already in a grad school, supporting um, document accessibility? Um, I can say for UT Austin, our grad school is definitely supportive of it, um, but we have the problem of not enough staff time. So everybody wants to improve the accessibility, but nobody has had the time yet to do the really great work that Liz has done to create the templates. Um, but you know, now that we know that these wonderful templates exist, maybe we can just steal them. <laughs> uh, I think I read earlier that somebody said that there's a way to make an actual word template where you, with drop downs and stuff. Um, I couldn't figure that out. Uh, at least a most super intuitive way for students, um, which is why mine is just a word document. But if you do end up figuring out how to use the template version of Word, do let me know because I am interested in that as an option. Oh, here's one. Um, we've run analytics on the software students are using to create their ETDs, um, and they're using a lot of free and open source applications. Do you have any recommendations about how we get students to use the gold standard applications like Word, InDesign, and Adobe Acrobat? Some students might not have the licenses to those. Um, I'll say that our university provides copies of um, Microsoft Office, so our students all have versions of Word, um, and that's why I, all of my resources are, this is how you do this in Word, this is a Word template, all of this Word stuff, except my little section on the tech. Um, there might be, I'm thinking there might be some kind of solutions that you could promote, like um, Microsoft Office for students might be cheaper than, you know, some free and open source software. So you could see if there's any kind of options like that that you could encourage students to sign up for, because I think there has to be some sort of discount for students or even free versions um, that I guess I would recommend searching for. Um, this isn't something that I've really had to worry about just because we give out word to our students. We also, I believe, have word available to students. I don't know, Laura, if it's the same at Texas State. We do, I, and, and oh, uh, yeah. Acrobat, I believe so. And at least on campus, which, um, but I think even off campus. Um. Uh, 
Uh, I'll have to check out the um, Mississippi State t um, templates because it sounds like they use the drop down version. Are there any Excuse other me. questions from folks? Uh, yes, our students also get a copy of Acrobat Pro or the Adobe Suite. They, I think they get the whole, you know, they get Photoshop and everything. So um, our university is very good about providing software. There's a question here for all three of us um, asking whether librarians should have a role in educating campuses about accessibility. Um, I would say for our campus, I think we probably should have a role just because of um, the repository that we host that has all sorts of content. And we have been trying to encourage people to improve the accessibility of the documents they're uploading. Um, and so it would make sense for us to um, be educating you know, students and faculty about that. Yeah, I'd say at our campus, I think it would be great to have a partnership because it's we really need to work and that's something we're starting to do. But I think it would be great if we can build a formal partnership with our offices on campus and the graduate school and figure out the best way to offer that. And there is a question about receiving a link to the recording. We'll, we'll definitely be doing that. Um, it looks like there's a question that says writing centers. Um, our writing center for graduate students is mostly focused on content. They don't really focus on, you know, line editing or grammar or formatting. Um, they have very good groups that you know, like interdisciplinary writing groups. So it's more of a social activity than a kind of a technical activity. Um, but I think it would be great if, you know, they were part of the process of accessibility too. And there's a, Liz, question. There's a question. Oh, you go. Go ahead, Laura. You go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a there's a question that I think is probably for you, Liz. Um, if you get an inaccessible ETD, do you have the ability or maybe the authority to reject it and send it back to the student? Um. I think I have the authority. I just don't have the personal resources to keep tracking them down. So we'll get, I'll get, you know, papers that are sent to me and then I will give feedback and they just have to go back and forth. So I can say, you know, please do these accessibility tasks. Um, but if, you know, they, they meet the formatting requirements um, and they just refuse to do these, like I'm still going to accept it. Um, and maybe in the future I'll have more resources to, to really hound them in, but um, like I could, I could make it absolutely mandatory, but we decided not to do that just for, you know, ease of getting papers through. Yeah. Okay, and then there's the question, do you have to report anything to upper administration? Um, I can't speak for our grad school, but um, I know in the library we are required to report. We just typically do report um, information about our repository, including accessibility efforts. I at the graduate school don't have to. It's pretty much just me kind of on this. Um, and I just kind of tell everybody I'm doing it. Okay, I think we're pretty close to um, one o'clock and I don't see any other questions unless I've missed something. So I think unless somebody has a last minute question, we can say thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I do see one. Okay. Um, does it become a legal issue if your repository is open access, but there are documents that don't comply with accessibility standards? Um, 
So this is where, <laughs> excuse me, I'm not an expert, but I think the answer is yes. Um, if there's content that's on public websites and it's not accessible, that's a problem. Um, I do not know other than the University of California a few years ago, um, whether this has come up a lot when it's not um, course related material. Um, I know we have not had any specific um, legal problems regarding um, content in our repository that might not be accessible, um, but I don't know about the rest of y'all. Um, I do know that the Department of Education can issue Title IX warnings to institutions if their websites are not have issues that have been reported. And generally, universities don't like Title IX conflicts. That I'll makes them that's... stand up and pay attention. Yeah, that's something we're looking at now is some policies on that, because if the if we get a request for an item later, like even for audio video, and we don't have an accessible copy, we have to fill that request. So we're thinking we should make it accessible the first time. Um, since students may graduate, because we've been seeing an uptick in more multimedia formats with with the theses and dissertations. So that's just that's a whole other web. <laughs> I know that when I've tried to ask about accessibility here on our campus and I am asking specifically about our repository, there's a lack of understanding about what that means because we have like over 150,000 PDFs. Well, maybe not all PDFs, but 150,000 files in there. And so when I ask about it, the answer is, yeah, everything has to be accessible. And then when I say, well, there's 150,000 items, does that mean everything that is in there? And then, the, you know, the conversation kind of changes. So I think that there's also a little bit of a lack of understanding about what repositories are and, and what's involved in managing them. But I'd say we're, we are now at one o'clock, so I want to make sure that we let all of you go. Thank you so much for joining us um, and stay tuned for future Tuxedo Workshop um, webinars. <laughs>